Okay, and we are live. Welcome to a new episode of All Things Xbox Podcast. Once again, I've got Logan with me. Logan, how are you doing this week? Doing pretty good, Jamie. It's a it's a lovely day in the neighborhood. How about yourself? It's been a good week outside of the news that we've seen today and the people's reactions and stuff. It's been a good week. Been playing some good games, watching some good films. Been a good time. And, you know, we have a lot of topics to go over. Some really exciting ones. And by the way, for people just getting to the show, if you listen to this show afterwards, uh, no doom and gloom. I'm always very... I wouldn't say... I'm, I don't force positivity. I'm just a positive person when it comes to gaming. So, like, I'm try, I keep, I try to keep a level head when it comes to these things. And I think, you know, some reactions are warranted when it comes to certain things in the news. <coughs> excuse me. And some aren't. Anyway, before we get into all the topics, which we have a ton of this week... Like, normally we have, like, 12 to 15 topics. If we go through everything, we've got probably about 18 topics. It's kind of stupid. Anyway, Logan, have you been playing anything interesting this past week? Yeah, I um, I finished Dark Forces Remastered. Absolutely loved it. It was phenomenal. Just, you know, chef's kiss, pristine, like, you can tell, artfully done. This was a passion project from somebody... And they who revered the, the source material and knocked it out of the park. Fully recommend it. Awesome experience. Beat that. And speaking of Night Dive, they have teased that they have a announcement coming very soon. Keep an eye on their thing and that they're cooking something. So maybe a cool new announcement or reveal of a title people have been wanting. Who knows? But... Keep an eye on their accounts. They're they're clearly up to something. And so I finished that. Been playing a little bit of Brotato here and there. Playing some Power Wash Simulator. Catching up on all the expansions they added. Like the Warhammer one. And I just started a new horror game that came out a couple years ago called Phobia St. Dinfa Hotel. And... It is basically like your late 90s, early 2000s, Resident Evil inspired game. Like, you know, inventory management, your um, kind of tanky controls, but not too bad. And you're an investigative journalist who is looking into this kind of secret society cult thing. And it's it's really good so far. So I have high hopes for it, and I'll share more once I've finished it. But how about you, Jamie? You still uh, rocking the world of Pandora? <laughs> uh, I, I had to take a break. Uh, I, I, if there's a game I love and I take breaks, that just means like I really love the game because I don't want to get too burnt out. But uh, Avatar is just like, it's a magical game. It's It's massive. It's one of those games that screams like it's a next-gen game. And I, I think more people need to play it. It's a shame that Ubisoft didn't really market the game when it came out. Uh, which is a shame because you have basically a game based in the world of two of the most successful movies of all time. And Ubisoft did nothing with marketing. Assassin's Creed Mirage had more marketing, which was shocking. But that game was great. But I've mainly been playing Judgment. I finished Judgment. Incredible game. Um, I'll do a little mini review of that after I've talked about other games I've been playing. Uh, Dragon's Dogma 2, which we're going to talk about because that game's interesting. Um, and I just finished a game called Return to Grace. It's a sci-fi adventure game. It, it launched in Game Pass, I think, three or four weeks ago. Really cool game. It's short, and if people want one of those games where you play it a few minutes each day to get an achievement, that's definitely one of those games. Uh, you can basically get every achievement in one playthrough if you clone one of your saves halfway through the game. Now... Those are the games we've been playing. Judgment. I have to say, I've always wanted the Yakuza series to come to Xbox, but unfortunately for me, uh, when Yakuza Zero came to Xbox in, I think, 2019 or 2020, uh, I made the mistake of messing up the sync progress uh, when I turned on Yakuza Zero one day and I lost about, like, 42 hours of progress. Oh, I know how that feels, trust me. Yeah, it, and it was it was awful. Like It was heartbreaking. And, you know, when that happens to you, you kind of don't want to go back to it. 
So like I put off playing Yakuza games for a while. And then Yakuza Like a Dragon came out in 2020 with the launch of the, the Series X. And I started that, played it, loved it. But that game has insanely difficult difficulty spikes. <laughs> like really big ones uh, because I was probably playing the game wrong. And the problem with me is I don't grind in JRPGs. I, I make the game harder for myself just by going forward with the story, <laughs> um, which I shouldn't have done. It's, my, it's, it's a skill issue. Let's call it a skill issue. Uh, and I kind of like put that off for a bit. But I've always been interested in Judgment. And that game, I bought it when it came out. But I just never played it up until about a few weeks ago. And Judgment, I have to say, is probably one of the best games I've ever played. It's incredible. I finished it in about 30 hours, 15 minutes, exactly. It has a ridiculous amount of side content. There's mini games, there's arcade games, like you've seen in other Yakuza titles. You can go into this game without knowing anything about the Yakuza games, and you're going to be completely fine. It's You play as a detective. It, it's I won't talk about the story because it's going to be very spoilerific, but Judgment is arguably one of the, I'd say, top 25 best games I've ever played. Like, incredibly good. The fighting is good. There's no grinding in the game. The level-up system works really well. And for people that like, you know, Japanese games with, you know, English voice acting, this is great. The, the voice acting is arguably some of the best in all of Japanese games, in my opinion. And I think more people need to play it. I give it a game. I, I gave the game about a 9.5. Um, incredible game. I already have the sequel started, Lost Judgment, and already... Even though I've played about an hour and a half, the sequel, it's arguably even better so far with the gameplay mechanics. Incredible stuff. Now let's talk about Dragon's Dogma. Now, Logan, I assume you haven't played Dragon's Dogma. I have not jumped into it yet. I am one of, you know, the dozens of us <laughs> who haven't jumped in yet, but it is one I am interested in. Yeah, so once once every so often a game comes along that grabs everyone's attention, you know, for me and for a lot of people a few years ago, it was Elden Ring. Elden Ring grabbed everyone's attention. And if you remember online, people were talking about Elden Ring. Everyone for like three months straight. You know, people were posting their videos of their boss fights, them finding secrets and stuff. And it became a very community-focused game, even though it's a single-player game mainly. And everyone was talking about it nonstop. And like two years later, people are still waiting still waiting for the dlc which drops in june so like that game's special and i think the, the time before that happened was something else was probably red dead redemption 2 so these games don't come along often and capcom they brought out dragon's dogma i think it was friday gone it's incredible it's one of those games that has emergent gameplay where basically you find things things happen things happen by chance and like early on in the game you fight the cyclops but if you throw an exploding barrel at a dam, the river will literally like blow over the cyclops into the ground and knock away half of its health. Health, And it's just, it's so good. It's so good. And this is probably going to go down as one of the best games of the generation. It has had an, an awkward launch because of the performance on PC, no matter what graphics card you have. So if you have like a 4090 Ti X Super Edition, you're going to get like two frames per second. It's like it's not optimized well on PC from what I've been told, which is a shame because it's a great game. And Capcom, from what I know in the past, Capcom are really good at optimizing games, be it Monster Hunter or Resident Evil. So this seems like a weird one-off. But on console, you know, it's 30 frames. It has ray tracing. Uh, the game is beautiful. It's, it's hard to describe <laughs> what Dragon's Dogma is because it's a weird mix of Oblivion, Skyrim, and... The Witcher 3, it's like, it's a weird combination, but it just works. And everyone's talking about it, people's posting the boss fights, and there are no horses in the game. There's no mounts, you have to walk from place to place, and that's a big topic as well, because, um, so early on, you have to go to a city, the main city in the game. It's a big, beautiful city like you've seen in Lord of the Rings and pretty much any major fantasy film. And you get given two options. You can walk on foot if you want, or you can take the ox cart, which is basically a, a fast travel system. So I decided to walk because I wanted to have that journey. 
I didn't realize it would be literal miles. <laughs> so I got maybe halfway and I was like, I just can't do this anymore. I'm fighting all these different goblins. There's a griffin flying in the sky, which is just kicking my behind. And I was like, no. So I walked back to the ox cart and then went to the city. And it's a great game. It really is. If people are looking for one of those RPGs that's going to grab their attention for a long time, this is that game. The only issue outside of its performance and there's microtransactions in the game, which you can earn everything, by the way, just in-game. You don't have to buy them. Uh, there's a thing that's been going around called Dragon's Plague. And it is the most... How should I put it? It's the weirdest game mechanic I've ever seen a developer put in a game. To the point where a lot of us are afraid to even play the game <laughs> and go back to it because... So Dra Dragon's Plague, for people that don't know is this affinity some characters can get. Now, in the game, you, you obviously play as the main character, and you also create a pawn, a main pawn, which is a, a main party member, which you can equip with different classes, equipment, and whatnot. And they can get this thing called Dragon's Plague if you fight a dragon or a drake. Now, if these characters go to other people's games, they can catch Dragon's Plague. But if one of your other pawns catches Dragon's Plague, if you sleep at an inn after a certain amount of time, a cutscene plays where <laughs> that pawn turns into a dragon and kills everyone in the town, including quest givers. Meaning, <laughs> you could actually break your own game with an in-game mechanic that's there on purpose. Shocks. Like, what I buy a That's pretty meta. <laughs> yeah, like, it, it, like, it's cool, don't get me wrong, it's the coolest thing ever, but it's the worst thing ever at the same time, because you can effectively break your own game, and, like, I went to play it yesterday, and now I'm super suspicious of my pawns, <laughs> so, like, sometimes they'll backtalk to you and not do things that you ask them to, like, lower a bridge, or say, uh, lower a ladder, or stuff like that, or heal you, and they'll grow, uh, like, red eyes over time. So everyone online is just posting pictures and like video of them inspecting their pawns. Like people are super suspicious. So if my pawn isn't praising my every single move, I am suspicious. <laughs> and like, like one of my pawns. This if, sounds like the apocalypse, man. Yeah, this is how paranoia starts. <laughs> yeah, like like last night when I was playing, one of my pawns uh, said that they weren't interested in camping again, and I kind of thought like, are you, have you got it too? <laughs> and I was thinking, is it time for me to chuck him in the ocean? Because you can do that. You can throw your main pawn in the ocean, and you know you can get rid of it that way. The other pawns in the game doesn't work that way, but it's a great game. People are going to be talking about this game for months. It's probably going to be one of the best games of the generation. Um, they are going to put out an update soon, so you can remove uh, motion blur, which is fantastic for me. They're going to let you turn off ray tracing in the future. Apparently that's going to be in the next update, so performance should actually be better, and if you have a a TV or a monitor with VRR support, you, your frames are just going to get even better. But outside of that, it's an amazing game. And <laughs> I've learned the hard way with certain things in the game, so camping kits weigh a lot, and if you're like me, you thought they were consumable items. So I was carrying around seven, meaning my main character had armor and apple, and a bunch of camping kits. I couldn't carry anything in that game. It was pathetic. It's all because I didn't pay attention. It happens. <laughs> but I highly recommend the game. <laughs> it's an amazing game. Uh, the combat is unlike anything else. It's um, You can grab on the enemies. Like, there's huge enemies in the game. It, it's weird because it has elements of uh, Shadow of the Colossus in the game. So it's Shadow of Colossus meets The Witcher 3. And Skyrim. That's the best way I can describe it. Anyway, before we continue, we have the first super chat of the day by Nick W. Thank you very much, Nick, uh, for the four ninety nine. He says, uh, "Do you guys think twenty twenty four is is the, hold on? Do you do you guys think that twenty twenty four is the I'm guessing the year of RPGs? Definitely, definitely. You know, you've just had the Yakuza. I say it like a dragon, infinite wealth. You have Persona four, sorry, Persona three reload. Uh." Unicorn Overlord just came out. You have Dragon's Dogma 2, uh, Avowed launches later on in the year. And, uh, you know, Atlas's next game, I always mess up the name, uh, Metaphor Revantazero. 
I murdered the name up there. I know I did. But yeah, it's arguably one of the best years in gaming for RPGs. And the thing is, there's RPGs coming out this year that haven't been announced yet. So, like the Oblivion remake. Uh, Logan, what's your thought on the whole thing? Because it does seem so far that this year is great for RPGs. Yeah, this year is going to um, just be incredible for RPGs. Like, all those you mentioned, and then some that aren't announced yet, and probably some indies that we um, have forgotten or haven't listed. And, you know, sometimes they shift the dates on some things. Some things might come out sooner than we expect, or some might get pushed back. You know, there's the... You think Oblivion Remaster Remake is going to be happening, you know, imminently. Potentially the Fallout one for Fallout 3. It seems like a no-brainer to put that out near the show launch. If they were going to, it seems like a perfect opportunity. Yeah, it's just a fantastic gear for RPGs just by themselves. And then, you know, take a step back. Gaming this year is just wild. I know there's a lot of negative headlines and a lot of FUD and a lot of other stuff, but purely from a gaming quality content perspective, this year is loaded. Yeah. And I put it like this. I'd say 90% of the games I play are RPGs. Like, I I, I just love RPGs. Uh, So the thing is, you know, despite all the FUD that's going around, Microsoft, they have a huge investment in, like, first-party RPGs, so... That's a big win. Which is glorious. Yeah, and you know, there's a lot of GRPGs coming to the platform this year. And GRPGs, by the way, on Xbox, there's more coming. Uh, one I keep really looking forward to is a game called Lost Helden. It's a PlayStation 1-style GRPG, but with modern graphics uh, made by uh, some of the creators of Final Fantasy. Looks amazing. And I don't know, it's, it's a great time to be a fan of the genre. It's, like I'd say RPGs and horror games specifically are popping off really well this year uh, i just hope that maybe can some developers make third person shooters again <laughs> like i i i love open world games and i love rpgs but i uh, i like to play third person or first person shooters in between single player ones and we just don't really get many now so like rpg fans like myself it's great times outside of that for shooters it's it's, it's slim but anyway, thank you for the four ninety nine Nick W. Great year for RPGs, and next year is probably going to be great as well. And Visions of Mana, by the way, comes out this summer, and like I'm really looking forward to that. I've never been able to play the Secret of Mana games before, so this is going to be my first Secret of Mana game, which is really cool. Um, you know, and it, I I do hope like with Microsoft doing remasters now, they need to do Lost Odyssey. I I talk about that game all day. Because it's amazing, uh, but it needs quality of life improvements. Just just small things, you know. I think it could use a difficulty slider because when the first main boss in the game is one of the hardest in the entire game, we have a problem. I have nightmares about that blue worm. <laughs> like, like, I'd never want to see. He that. was pretty awful. Yeah, like I grinded by the way in that area around the sand for like twenty hours before I could beat that boss, and it's the first boss outside of the tutorial. What were they thinking? Outside of that, it's a masterpiece. Um, you know, let's let's get into all the topics now because we have a lot to go over. Uh, so, cassette beasts. I know Pyro and Chat will be excited about this. So, cassette beasts is a Pokemon style game. It launched in Game Pass last year. Had great reception. People really like it. Uh, but one of the things people have noticed on Xbox, PlayStation, and PC that a lot of a lot of Pokemon style games. For some reason, on console and PC, do not have multiplayer or trading. Um, and anyway, they had their event last night. It was it was like eight minutes long, and the game is getting multiplayer. It's getting PvP and trading, so it's going to get basically the things people love from the Pokemon games. And I've never played the game. It's one of those games I've kind of put off because there's just too much coming out. There's too many games in Game Pass for me to play, <laughs> uh, but it's already downloaded. It looks really cool, and it's good to see a smaller game get those sort of features. Because, like Logan, I know you played uh, Nexomon, which is a Pokemon style game, but that game was severely lacking multiplayer, wasn't it? Yeah, like 
it almost makes you wonder if, like, again, this is purely speculation, not, you know, anything concrete, but almost makes you wonder if some of the companies wanted to kind of stay more in the shadows of, you know, away from Nintendo's ninjas, so to speak, to where they're like, okay, we'll do, like, okay, you know, monster collecting, hunting, you know, battles, you know, gyms versus, you know, whatever you want to call the equivalent, you know, basically Pokemon, but not Pokemon, with some different twists and story stuff. Maybe that they purposely kept the multiplayer out or pretty limited to where there was less similarities. But, you know, I'm excited to see how this works out. I, I remember back in the day, you know, getting friends together and hooking up the cables and, you know, battling each other, you know, back to back on, you know, Game Boy Color and, um, you know, trading Pokemon to evolve them or, you know, all kinds of stuff. So I, I'm definitely intrigued and it's got my interest. Yeah, I, I'm going to get to the game now. And I think like you need PvP in a game like that. And I'm someone that kind of sticks away from multiplayer, but... Like you said, like when we were kids, like playing Pokemon was massive, especially at the school I was at. Everyone played Pokemon. Everyone battled. Oh each yeah, other. if you did, you were weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, like I remember, like everyone at my school would take their Game Boy to, to school and just play Pokemon. Like that was the thing then. Um, and it's good to see these indie games are taking, you know, taking charge because I think, like in the Pokemon space, Pokemon's always going to be number one, but Pokemon is only on Nintendo. Fortunately, on Xbox, you have Pokemon with guns, kind of, with Pal World, and that's going to get PvP. So I think it's good that we're actually seeing these things come to light. And it's good to see that an indie game got so much support that the add-in features people wanted. Because, like, that and Nexomon, I've seen people want PvP in Nexomon for years. And fortunately, the third game, I believe, is going to have that, which is a, th- a full-on 3D open-world Pokemon-style game. But yeah... Cassette Beast looks super cool. It's in Game Pass. It's getting more features. And personally, I can't wait to go to it because it's downloaded. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, So, man, we've got way too much to talk about. Okay, (laughs) let's trash on a game that hasn't been announced yet. So, I like superhero games, but we don't get many of them. Uh, Well, anyway, tomorrow there's a brand new Marvel game being announced. Right? Now, imagine my excitement. Brand new Marvel game. It turns out it's going to be a 6v6 Overwatch style game. Blah. Yeah, that's um, disappointing to say the least. Like, I I do not I do not play multiplayer at all, really. So like, even that was like, really, do we really need another 6v6 multiplayer game or any multiplayer game? I, I don't want any more battle royales. I don't want any like. We, if you want to play Overwatch, you've got Overwatch. If you want to play Valorant, play Valorant. They should at least bring Valorant to console. But outside of that, like I do not see anyone hype for a six v six superhero game. And like I think we're at a point now where I think multiplayer, it's it's kind of saturated and it's not at the same time. Like there's not much competition in the space, but people are creatures of habit. So it's like people don't want to buy into playing something else. That may be similar to what... Like, like Destiny fans didn't move to Anthem. You know? Division fans didn't move to Anthem. An- Anthem killed itself and they left, the tr- they left the Christmas lights on. I'll never get over that. Um, but yeah, Logan, what's your thought on the whole 6v6 Marvel th- game? Because that does not interest me. <laughs> yeah, once when I saw, ooh, new Marvel game getting teased, I'm like, alright, you have my interest. But then it, <laughs> I turned like that Drake meme, and I just turned my gaze away when it was, when it was 6VE, and just, I don't know, it's like, was anybody really asking for that? I mean, I guess they thought somebody was, but, you know, I hope it does well for its sake, but it's definitely not one I have any interest in at all. Yeah, I think a lot of... The problem is that every time you see a multiplayer game announced now, uh, there's no hype for it at all. Like, I'm sure people in chat have heard of a game called X Defiant by Ubisoft. Uh, Tom Henderson on Twitter the other day broke that it's getting delayed 
<laughs> again. And I felt like I played that open beta a year and a half ago. They keep putting off the release. And like the truth is, it wasn't fun. And if a multiplayer isn't fun, it's not going to get people's attention. But again, people are creatures of habit. People don't want to move to something else. Like If another game comes out tomorrow that's like Halo but isn't Halo, Halo fans aren't going to swarm to that because they've already got Halo. Call of Duty fans aren't going to go to X Defiant because, one, it's not fun at all. I played it. And, you know, same with Battlefield. Battlefield's in a weird spot, but Battlefield fans aren't going to move to something else. They're just not. Uh, but yeah, Marvel, multiplayer game. It's going to be announced tomorrow. Yay! But in other good Marvel news, the Unreal Engine 5 event was the other day, and they showed off, finally, the Amy Hedig single-player action-adventure game, which is called Marvel 1993 Rise of Hydra. It's arguably graphically the best-looking game I've ever seen in my entire life. It was... I thought it was a movie I missed. Yeah. It was insane. <laughs> yeah, like, like when I, the first clip I saw was of um, the Black Panther walking across a bridge talking. I was thinking, is this a clip from a new film? Because, <laughs> like, that's where we're at now with real time graphics. And, like, even though they didn't show any gameplay, uh, you know, it's open world Paris, I believe. I think Wakanda's going to be in the game as well. You can play as Black Panther or Captain America. And, man, like, even though it's just graphically what they showed us, there's no gameplay. Apparently, that's in-engine. That's really impressive. And I think that was one of those moments where I thought, oh, so that's next generation. Because we're four years into this generation right now, and people still refer to current-gen games as next-gen. And I think there's a bunch of good reasons for that. But, man, it looks super good. You know, Amy Hennig, she's been writing this story for ages. They wanted to be a technical show showcase. It, they didn't announce any platforms, but it's coming out next year. So, pretty much Xbox, PlayStation. I don't know how that would run on a Switch 2. To be fair, we don't even know what's really going to be in a Switch 2. But, it looks super cool. Um, I think we will be seeing gameplay for that at the E3, whatever it's going to be called this year. Digital showcase thing. Logan, outside of the graphics and all that stuff, what was your overall opinion of like the stuff shown? Because it looked super good and the premise does look good. Yeah, I um I love Captain America and Black Panther and the whole, you know, World Wars era setting is super fascinating to me. And I I love Amy Hennig and all the work she's done. I'm still bitter and salty to this day at EA for canceling Orca. And for those who don't know code names that was supposedly her scoundrelly kind of game set during the original trilogy era where you were part um you were a guy who's working basically with the rebel alliance but not part of the rebel alliance and you um used gadgets and you know explored and quested and helped try to take down the empire during the height of the Empire's reign, and it sounded and looked incredible, and to this day, I'm still mad at EA for dropping the ball on that. Yeah, EA messes up. <laughs> I think that's like a, a bi-monthly occurrence at this point. Um, but yeah, anyway, the, the Marvel game, it looked great. Uh, again, we should, I'm guessing, seeing gameplay this summer. I think that we get getting to a point now in the generation where people are wanting to see what these machines can do. Uh, you know, I think you know mixing up art styles is what we need to see of not just realistic stuff, but if you want realistic games and like single player stuff, that's going to be a game that people need to pay attention to. But yeah, looks super cool. Can't wait to play it. And the thing is, just going off a in-game cinematic, I'm already sold. <laughs> uh, you know, I personally love Captain America. I've always been a fan of the the more stoic superheroes that people call boring <laughs> you know like superman um you know uh, cyclops and you know captain america so like for me it looks super cool i can't wait to play it uh you know another piece of information that came to light the other day is that uh alpha protocol by obsidian uh which came out in what 2009 2010 it's been a while 
Uh, well, it turns out that got relisted on GOG, and it has all a bunch of you know updates, quality of life improvements. It has a right a relicensed soundtrack. It has achievements, which I didn't even know GOG had. Good for them. Um, and it got people thinking, like, are they going to bring that out to Xbox? Because why would you go to all the effort to, like, just have it on GOG? Now, personally, for me, that was one of those games I missed back in the day because that came out during my Call of Duty days. Um, I think Obsidian need to bring this to console. Be it backwards compatibility with the 360 version or a remaster because, you know, it's one of Microsoft Studios. I know, Logan, you've been wanting this game to come to console for the longest time now. Yeah, absolutely. It's a um, it's a cult classic, hidden gem. The game, up front, yes, the game has some issues. Like, you could tell it was made from an independent studio at the time. There's some tech difficulties. Um, there's some tropes and stuff that may or may not be considered problematic today that were less so than... But, you know, taking it aside from that, like, the whole plot and the story, the gameplay was really fun and enjoyable. You're like, you're this super spy guy, and you're like a Commander Shepard role, kind of, where you've got this, you know, group of people you work with, and you go around and you do all this espionage type stuff with trademark obsidian you know, you can talk your way out, you can shoot your way out, you can sneak your way out, or you can somehow double, triple cross everybody and convince them to just blow each, blow each other away. And it was super fun, and I loved it. And it was just a colossal shame that it was never made BC. Like, to this day, it still blows my mind it didn't make the cut. Like... I know it got delisted, and they said they were working with Sega to, you know, get it listed. And it sounds like they worked something out for GOG. Hopefully, at the very least, they could pull a BC thing where if you already own the disc or own it digitally, you can play it. Like, at the very least, let the people who have it play it. But, you know, hopefully they can make it fully BC or remaster, remake it, because my guess is, it's been a while since I've played it, but my guess is the visuals probably are not going to hold up so great, among other things. But, again, great game, fully recommend it, glad it's back. Hope It and Saboteur, which is another game that got randomly relisted somewhere, hopefully both of those can make the cut to Xbox, because... They deserve them, and the fans that are deserve to experience them. Yeah, you know, before we continue with this topic, uh, if you're enjoying the show, please like, share, and subscribe. Hit that bell for notifications. It really does help the channel out and the show and all the weekly content I have planned coming. And Super Chats are live if you want anything answered, questions, all that stuff. Anyway, now that leads me on to uh, sort of something I didn't really have planned to talk about, and that's backwards compatibility. That's It's been a big feature for Microsoft since 2015. Uh, we talk about it all the time. I think BC is a huge thing because you have over 600 360 games alone like available to play, which is crazy. Um, and there's games backwards compatible that aren't even listed, which I have a video coming out soon about, which is interesting. But uh, BC has been huge for Microsoft because they, they increase the amount of games over time. They've gave those games upgrades, be it resolution enhancement, 60 frames, or even some games, 120 frames. There's auto HDR, super fast loading, which is really cool. It makes these games not only play better, but look better with modern features. And anyway, later on this year, I think they said summer, uh, the 360 store on 360 is shutting down. You're still going to be able to buy 360 games on your Xbox One, on your PlayStation, sorry, no, PlayStation, uh, on your Xbox One. I was One. like, well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on your Xbox One and uh, Xbox Series consoles. Um, I've been talking too much today about certain topics, but yeah, uh, on your Xbox consoles. Uh, so that's not really going to be an issue. However, with everything that's been going on with the BC front, I honestly think that Microsoft... This is just a hypothetical. I think Microsoft may be planning another batch of games. 
that isn't a leak. I agree. It's not a rumor. It's just that the the BC team have been quiet for so long. There's been the rumor that they're working on Activision games, which I've covered in the past. It just seems like if you're shutting down the 360 store for good, and there's like most of the games that aren't BC that you can still buy on 360. Uh, like some of the games have license issues when it comes to music, like the Saboteur. Right, I praise that game all the time. It's GTA meets Assassin's Creed and World War Two Paris. It's an amazing game, and you know that's kind of lost to time. But it's a bit weird that that game got relisted on Steam. It has its licensed soundtrack, and it's like maybe that'll be one of the games because I don't know. It's like we we had that surprise batch in twenty twenty one. I think, uh, where we got 70 new games. 70 new games added to backwards compatibility. And then they said, okay, we are really done this time. I don't know. They say a lot of things. <laughs> and I just think, like, it would be a good way to send off the 360 store on 360 by having a new batch. Uh, so, personally, I think they're going to have another batch of games. Like, Logan, what would your reaction be if at their summer showcase, you know, they show all the new games off? potentially new hardware maybe a handheld and then one of the little tidbits they have in there is oh yeah there's a new batch of games i would be euphoric and that would probably honestly be my highlight maybe that makes me sound like a boomer i don't know (laughs) but i just i love game preservation and some of these games in particular i want to re-experience or i missed out on you know I just, I want to play them on modern hardware. And especially for games that are first party now, it seems almost, I don't know if insulting is the right word, but it seems kind of egregious to not have your first party games available to play on your modern platforms when technically and legally feasible. Like, if they are feasible, come on. Let, let, let's do it. I I know the industry's in a bind. I know there's all this other stuff, but if y'all can somehow resurrect some of these other games for GOG and other things, surely you can put it on your own bloody console. Like that that's all I'm gonna say on that, but I think there will be an ABK batch. And it wouldn't shock me if Saboteur would sneak in there or something like that as well. Or, you know, a game like Alpha Protocol. It just makes too much sense, and it'd be a perfect way to, okay, we've closed the 360 store, but we extended one last, you know, arc or life raft for a few stranded, and, okay, we move on. Like, it just seems perfect. Yeah, I mentioned it because, you know, with the store closing down, we haven't had any games get, you know, upgrades for, what, a year and a half? Like, nothing's been added. There's no frames per second boost added. There's no resolution enhancements. Um, You know, some games had HDR removed, which, uh, in my opinion, was actually a good thing because some games with HDR, it's awful. <laughs> uh, it, it makes some games way too saturated. Um, But, like, I do think we are going to see another batch. It just makes two sense. Like, how, like, what, what exactly are the backwards compatibility team doing? Are they just sitting, you know, playing Tetris all day or something? I don't know, but I think it's coming, and it will be cool because you know while people will say, "Oh, I want to watch E3," I'm just going to call it E3. By the way, um, it would be cool, like you know, for me and you and a lot of other Xbox owners. But you will have that contingent of people that will be like, "I want to see new games," like. I put it like this, on my shelf of games I have out are games I call active games, you know? I have Xbox 360, Xbox One, original Xbox, and Xbox Series games. And those are games pretty much I can play on the consoles I have mainly set up. But, like, my N64 games, my PlayStation and PlayStation 2 games, my Game Boy games are all in storage because there's not really a decent way for me to play them. You know, my PlayStation 3 sounds like it's going to take off every time I turn it on to the point where, like, I I port beg Metal Gear Solid 4 a lot because, one, it's stranded on the PlayStation 3, but, like, if I play Metal Gear Solid 4 on my PlayStation 3, 
uh, my house will probably melt. <laughs> you know, um, so like <laughs> I, I want that game to come over. But like anyway, the BC stuff. I think it'll come. It just makes sense. You're gonna shut down the store when what the Xbox 360s will be 19 years old, not 20. Feel old yet? The Xbox 360 turns 20 next year. <laughs> Man, I feel anxious. <laughs> yeah, like I, I, I'm gonna be super excited for the 360. Um, but 20 years old, and you know, people will complain that the store shutting down. And personally, I, I don't think they should. But the fact that they've kept the store open for 19 years. That's kind of a first in the console space. So, you know, good on Microsoft. They've actually kept it alive that long. And, you know, it's one of the... Like, people say I'll hear on PlayStation, but the truth is I wish PlayStation did backwards compatibility. You know, their classic games, that's not backwards compatibility. Those are ports. Those are ports with a different sticker on the, the title. Anyway, we'll move on. Been talking about BC way too much. Okay, let's complain about Xbox executives. Um... So some executives from Take Two and EA and all that have basically been coming out over the past few weeks and months, actually, saying that uh, gamers should expect less innovation and less risk in the console space, or should say the AAA game space. And gamers' reactions to that, I think, was you know sound. Like people, are like we want more originality in games. And like, look, we've talked about this a million times. Like every AAA game that comes out now, it's the same game. It's the same thing. We've played a million times. It may have a different coat of paint with a different voice actor and a different character. But every game that comes out now, it's the same thing we've played. Like, I've said this before, and I've heard other people say this as well. I fundamentally think that any game that ca- that comes out today, be it on Xbox or PlayStation or PC, outside of graphics, could run on a 360. Like... I totally believe that. Like, Logan, we've talked about this a million times, like I just said, but what's your thought on the executive saying we should expect less risk because every game is the same? That just... (laughs) That just reeks of CYA to me and kind of just... They're uh, basically getting creatively bankrupt or they're wussing out because... They're, you know, cowtailing to their shareholders too much. And, you know, I get it from a superficial financial standpoint that, yes, these are businesses. They need to make money. What is bringing in the most money? What's really working? And what is maybe not hitting certain numbers they like? But, you know... There are counters to that, like, if you always chase the white whale or the grand slam, you know, slam dunk, like, whatever jackpot analogy you want, if you're always chasing that, you know, odds are you're gonna miss way more than you hit. Like, if you hit, you better hope that you just absolutely nail it and make up for all the other ones you missed. Because... At this point, I think it's more sound, in my opinion, to have, you know, a few major franchises that you pump out, and, you know, they're enduring sagas, like your Star Wars type experience, where you've got, okay, you know, we've got this spinoff, we've got this mainline entry, you know, people who love that universe can continue to get content, and expand the horizons and it keeps on that machine keeps on chugging but then you also have smaller things that you try out and you gamble and you risk on and like you can plot throw them out as a smaller experience at first like take hi-fi rush like hi-fi rush is a phenomenal game very different very unique just truly brilliant auditory and visual experience It is a smaller game. Now, imagine they go, okay, everybody loved this. It was well-received. And, you know, it's a brilliant new IP. People want more of it. Now we can put more into it and make it bigger and potentially grow that even more and expand it into other things. Like, I think they should embrace more smaller risks 
instead of just, you know, going big or go home on just massive games. Have your massive games, a few of them, tent poles, to, you know, appease those fan bases and to keep some stability, but throw in a bunch of these smaller experimentals, see what hits, what doesn't, and whatever hits, then you blow it up and make it bigger. That That's what I would do personally, but again, I'm not the guy in some dark room running a, you know, $3 trillion company. Yeah, it's just a shame, man, because, like, like, don't get me wrong, I think GTA 6 next year, it's going to be amazing. I think that that Marvel game next year, it's going to be amazing. Judas, which we've seen more of today, which is by the creator of Bioshock, and that game looks amazing as well, but, like, and don't get me wrong, I'm excited for gaming more than ever, with all the titles coming, you know, potential hardware, and just, like, features games are going to get, but, like, if you look at the landscape of just like new and original games nothing is original and i think that's kind of sad uh you know like what really was the last original game i, I like hi-fi rush but w- would be up there you know it was a dmc style game with rhythm based combat we haven't really had that before and that game was a risk but that game was also a, a, a day one shadow drop but outside of that like risk in the triple a space alone it's like it's not there and it, it it is part on gamers' fault for not supporting certain games. You know, it's one of the reasons why I love double A games at the minute. You have Robocop Rogue City. A triple A developer would not make that. They would not make that at all. Uh it would be more of a linear Call of Duty style shooter instead of what it is. Uh and I'm grateful for that game. And I think I think over the next few years, at least I hope gamers pay more attention to double A. And Try and experience different genres, you know? I think that's going to be a way for people to get into other stuff. Because, again, every AAA game that we're going to see announced this summer, we've all played it. They've just got a different character with a different color scheme. Maybe it's a cartoon-style game. Maybe it's cell shaded or whatever. And it is what it is. And it's just like, I don't know, Like I look forward to E3s and the Game Awards and all that stuff, you know, Gamescoms for all the new reveals. But it just seems like, Okay, this looks cool, but I've played it before. And that's kind of sad, you know. Um I think that's one of the reasons why I praise Judgment so much. Like I've never really played a game like Judgment. Um, you know, Dragon's Dogma's great, but it's essentially a baby between, you know, Skyrim and The Witcher Three, and that's great. You know, I'd I'd actually say Dragon's Dogma is actually fairly original, but I don't know. I think we need to demand more and maybe support more experimental games. Like, uh, there was a game that came last year called Atlas Fallen. That game's actually pretty original. It has some insanely difficult uh, difficulty spikes. It has some gaming mechanics that I don't like, which I think they could patch out pretty easily. But outside of that, it's fairly original. Uh, I think one one of the reasons why people went so much towards Elden Ring is not because it's a Souls-like, it's because it's different. You know, that game does not hold your hand at all. You basically put out into this open map and just told, hey, beat bosses. That's essentially what you have to do. And you have these little gold things that come out of the ground that sort of loosely point to where you should go. But I think 20 plus million people loved Elden Ring because it was different. Like, what, what do you think about that, Logan? Because to me, like, even though Elden Ring was a lot like Dark Souls, but the fact that you had 20 million people buy it when that, that's considered a niche genre. Yeah, I mean, Elden Ring was the perfect game at the perfect moment, and it it delivered. It was the rare, you know, lightning strikes in a bottle to where all the elements were in place, and it actually... It, exceeded the hype that was already astronomical for it and it just those things can happen they're just very rare and it just like you were saying it just it feels like so many games these days are just rent and repeat versions of each other like you know this isn't a dig at PlayStation. This is just a um, a genre type I'm throwing out there. Like, you've got Sad Dad Goes to Space. Sad Dad, you know, 
in a war setting, sad dad medieval, you know, sad dad post-apocalyptic, you know. It's like, at the end of the day, eventually all these stories about Basically, you know, this father figure and their kid traveling or questing across the scape, whether it's among the stars or plant-riddled New York City, eventually you just, you're like, okay, I've, I've done the song and dance enough. Like, I get it. And, you know, the same thing. Like, some shooters are incredibly, you know, they're repetitive by nature, obviously, but you it's like okay how many point how many times do i have to fight the same world war ii battle over and over yeah. and over and over again <laughs> like with just a different coat of paint or you know better um audio or whatever it's like at, at some point there's got to be originality and that's not and that's coming from somebody who loves sequels and franchises and stuff like that. Like, give me more sequels and fran uh, and stuff of franchises I love, but also throw in new stuff that can become franchises and other things I love. Instead of just like, well, this worked for EA down the road, so we'll try it and we'll just call it this instead and see if we can, you know... Get some of those people over to here. Buddy, that's probably just not going to work. Those people are wedded to that franchise at this point. Yeah, you bring up a good point with the whole, uh, you know, war first-person shooter games. Because if you go back to the early 2000s, I kind of just had an epiphany. This has happened before. Every first-person shooter that came out in the early 2000s, that wasn't sci-fi. It was World War Two. You stormed the beach of Normandy. <laughs> you know, it was basically that scene of... Um, uh, save, so many times. Yeah, saving Private Ryan, <laughs> but in video game form. But in this game, it looked slightly better. You know? And people got... Like, every first-person shooter was just military first-person shooter, World War Two, storming the beach of Normandy. There would be some cutscene in between missions where there's just, like, a pan over of, of a map with, like, a red line going in between where your soldiers are marching. It's like every World War Two, Sorry, sorry every military first-person shooter was the same game. It was the same game. That's all we're playing. And that market got overly saturated uh, to the point where like Medal of Honor as a series kind of stopped selling. You know, people just got sick and tired because for some reason back then, developers thought a first-person shooter has to either be sci-fi or World War II, <laughs> which never really made much sense to me. But like when Modern Warfare came out, that completely changed the game and that felt different. You know, it, yes, it was another military first-person shooter, but it was, like, a different setting. You had modern guns. It was amazing. And that kind of changed the path of first-person shooters. Um, but, like, I always praised the 360 generation, the seventh gen, because we had so much originality. You know, Bioshock. Like, we, like Batman Arkham Asylum. People thought it was going to be a bad game because we were so used to bad superhero games. <laughs> and it came out and blew everyone away. And it was actually pretty original. It's an it's a Metroidvania set on a small island, and you play as Batman. Like that was crazy for the time. Um, I, I don't know, man. Like I, I like I said before, I'm looking forward to so many games. I can't wait for tons of games. But the problem is, it's, it's all the same stuff, you know. <laughs> and it's like, I, I think one of the reasons why I'm liking Dragon's Dogma, even though it has got Witcher elements and Skyrim elements, is because it's different. And, you know, one of the reasons why I love Judgment is because it's different. Uh, like, the, I put it as Judgment has quick time events, but they're actually good quick time events. And I never thought that could be a thing, you know? Uh, it's it's one of the few games, I think, that actually got quick time events right. And, you know, even on PlayStation, I'd say Helldivers it was actually a pretty original game. You know, yes, is it hard with ODST elements? Yes. However, it's clear that people love that game. And it's kind of original yeah, for the platform. Fun. Yeah, and it looks fun. Um, you know, Nintendo... I mean... <laughs> uh, the thing is, Nintendo can put out a new Mario or Zelda game, and it's going to sell like 50 million copies. It's going to be the game that people have played for years, but nobody cares, <laughs> you know? Um, I don't know. I just want more original games in the, the console space, you know? 
Uh, I think on PC you have more options because people basically make their own games with mods and stuff. I don't know. I just think things need to change. Anyway, we'll move on. Okay, let's get into this because I've been wanting to talk about this all week. So about a year ago, there was a game announced called, uh, I think it was called Enetoria The Last Song. Now, if you search this uh, the game's name on Twitter, you'll notice that I'm pretty much the only person that talked about this game because I cover you know upcoming games. And it was announced for Xbox Series XS, PlayStation 5, and PC, you know, the usual. And that was that. There's been no talk about that game since. There's no hype for it. It hasn't been on any major showcases. It just it is what it is. Microsoft over a few months ago, I think it was actually on one of their idea Xbox programs, and it's a Souls like made by an Italian studio. I think there's only like twelve developers or something. It's a super small team. And basically, uh, last week they put out this post, and I think the way it was worded because it was directly translated from Google Google Translate from Italian. And it was kind of worded in such a way where we're not putting it on Xbox so we can prioritize PC and PlayStation. Bear in mind, uh, it's a small studio. But the way it was worded, people flipped out. People started saying, oh, developers are now leaving Xbox and all this stuff. And it, it was predictable, the reaction. Um, and the reaction from it was pretty vile, actually. Uh, because people on Twitter were just like arguing each other. And I kind of shook my head because... This has happened before, and it happened before the rumors in January. Remember there was a game last year called Quantum Error? It was announced... Oh, yes, yeah, that yeah, one. Mind, this <laughs> I was, remember yeah, that one. This was 2023. <laughs> it was announced for, for PlayStation, and it would come to Xbox eventually. People lost their minds. You know, the developers start saying it's all about the SSD and all that stuff. And basically, they marketed the game off negativity because people are like oh xbox players won't get to play this the game comes out it's a bag of crap from what people are saying and the developers had a lot of media attention just because they didn't put the game on console oh, sorry on xbox right so this was before all the rumors and now people look at quantum error as a joke right um and it happened with this game people are putting these games like enatoria the last song not coming to Xbox as a result of what happened in January, in February, that's not really the thing. That's not really the case. People are overreacting. People like to connect the dots. It's like that meme from All of a Sunny in Philadelphia where he's connecting the dots on the wall. That's what people do with this. It was an overreaction. Now, I do think there's a cause for concern if it happens a lot or if, or if it happens often, but it rarely happens. You have these AAA games and indie games that are also just coming to Xbox and PC, but not PlayStation. You know, Stalker, arguably going to be one of the biggest games of the year, is Xbox and PC. Right? Develop And bear in mind, that studio, they're in the middle of a war. Right? Um, you know, will it go to PlayStation eventually? Possibly. Do I care? Not really. You know? uh, but now, all of a sudden, people love and want this Anatolia, the last song it's their most anticipated game but no one was talking about it like if scroll past a week on twitter it's just me just me talking about the game and it's like i feel like it was a, it's a bad translation they said it may come to xbox afterwards but like if you have a team of 12 people making this unreal engine 5 souls like you know it's obviously going to be taxing so like i understand it i didn't really like have a reaction to it however the fact that the team did take from what i assume allegedly marketing money from the idea at xbox team outside of that the whole thing looks shady logan what's your take on the whole thing because it was a messy week and i think people overreacted once again <laughs> yeah like to me personally it I don't think you can draw it, you know, direct correlation between it, you know, delaying or potentially skipping Xbox and the decisions about Hi-Fi Rush, Sea of Thieves, Grounded, you know, yada yada, Pentiment. Like, I think it was too soon of an announcement after those for you to make a direct correlation. Like... If this keeps happening and you keep seeing more and more games just go, 
nah, we good, and they just don't come to Xbox, then, okay, it's time for some conversations. But, you know, one indie game up front that happens to announce their plans not long after all that. I mean, it, it's something you make note of, but it's it's not a, you know, a surefire sign of some impending doom or anything like that. The thing to me that was really weird was the fact that it was advertised on ID Xbox and promoted like that. And then it's like, well, you know what? We're actually going to put that on the back burner. Like, I understand it if you're a smaller studio and you've got less resources, you're working on stuff, you look at your capital, you look at what you got, and you're like, okay, what platforms are we most likely going to make the most money from or sell the most units on or reach the biggest audiences on? Okay, for them, I guess in their calculus, it was probably those two. So they prioritize those. And then, you know, if they can, revisit Xbox. Like, I have no idea how the financial and all the other stuff with ID at Xbox, what is or isn't a thing about that allegedly all whatever that is out there it just on the surface seemed odd to be an i be promoted as an id xbox associated thing and then not be coming to xbox you know originally just it seemed weird but i'm sure they have valid reasons it was just odd yeah and like certain developers have through xbox shared and this has been going back generations by the way uh, if you remember, the developer of Braid was hating on 360 all the time back in the day. And, you know, it just it, it's one of those things where you have developers that actively don't like Xbox for some, because it's Microsoft. You have developers that generally don't have the money and means to port games to multiple platforms at the same time. And you, you have shady situations like the whole Quantum Era thing. Like, it could be either one of the three. Um now, like you said, if it keeps happening, that's when people should be worried. But it's happened once, you know, and people are correlating it to January. It's like, like, look, if I think Microsoft was abandoning the platform and all this stuff, I wouldn't invest any more money into the platform. I would tell people to go elsewhere. But I'm not there, right? Microsoft, we're going to be talking about the stuff in a bit. Like Microsoft, despite everything that's going around on the internet with food and all that stuff, and this Enatory, the last song, which everyone cares about, all of a sudden. They're going to be fine. But we are going to see situations like this on both platforms. Like, there are games that are coming to Xbox that aren't announced to come to PlayStation. Like, look at Pal World. Pal World is arguably one of the biggest games of the year. And what's the one question people keep asking them? What's that question that Jeff Keighley keeps asking? Like, the big focus is it going to PlayStation? It's because it's a big game, it's not on PlayStation, and it's on Xbox and PC, and it's one of the biggest games of the year, and it's only March. So I think people need to calm down. You know, it's just like it's a, it's an over the top reaction, and I think like there's a, I think the problem with a lot of gamers is that they take, they think criticism is reacting in in over the top ways. You know, there's being critical, and then there's overreacting, and gamers tend to overreact and think that's being critical, and in the gaming space, that's extremely toxic, and we see it every day on Twitter, especially on Twitter. And by the way, if you listen to the show and you don't use Twitter. You are so lucky. <laughs> you, you, you are very wise. Yeah, you, you haven't <laughs> you, like like me and Logan. We've, we've talked about this before. Like we, we lifers, we've admitted like we're not going anywhere. It's like once you're in the whole Twitter space thing, and that's you know you're basically addicted at that point. Um, I think people that game and just don't use Twitter, they probably happier people. Um, but anyway, I think Enitoria thing. I will say this. It's gave them a lot of marketing this past week. People are talking about the game. I've n- I've now so- seen people put this on their most anticipated list. Where where was it before? You know, <laughs> the game's been known for a year. It was announced a year ago with a trailer and screenshots, and nobody's talked about it other than me, which is weird. But anyway, we'll move on. Uh, that was just a weird a weird topic. Okay, Final Fantasy sixteen. This is going to be one of the big ones. So the game came out on PlayStation last year. The expansion comes out, I think, in April. I think it's April anyway. It comes out fairly soon. 
Um, you know, it had a positive reception at launch. Uh, but people been wanting like, is that game coming to Xbox? And you know, Jez Corden on Twitter's hinted at most multiple times that it could come or will come. I've said it's going to come because you know, look, Square Enix they've messed up in the past. However, they said more Final Fantasy games are coming. And by the way, if games were abandoned in the platform, you wouldn't have arguably one of the biggest ports of all time, Final Fantasy fourteen on Xbox. MMOs are arguably the biggest games and the hardest to make. It's on Xbox. Anyway, bit of a tangent. Um, so one of the, the creators of Final Fantasy 16 was talking about the PC port, which is meant to come out this summer. And there's a lot of excitement over that. And anyway, in the interview, he started talking about after the PC version's done, they're going to work on the, the version for other platforms. Now, while you do have the, the hellscape that is Reset Era, where people are saying it's all about Switch 2 and the PlayStation 5 Pro, they blatantly talk about Xbox. That there's a market for that game on Xbox. And I'm like 99.9997% sure it's coming to Xbox this year. You know, the, the platform exclusivity ended last year, I think in December. Uh, it's coming. I, I actually think it's going to be one of the games announced on the um, the Xbox showcase this June. It just makes sense. Logan, you know, now that one of the creators of Final Fantasy 16 has came out and said that, do you think Xbox is one of those platforms? I would be very surprised if it was not one of those platforms. Then again, you know, some of these Japanese companies have put out things where we're bringing it to all platforms, but then Xbox is somehow not considered a platform. But I... I assume uh, Yoshi P is quite a knowledgeable and savvy individual. He knows what he's doing. I'm, I, I think it's coming to Xbox. Yeah, yeah, and like in the past, like there, there have been Xbox ports of Final Fantasy games that have been amazing. By the way, this is one of the the things that people will ignore. Uh, the Final Fantasy X remaster on Xbox is full native four K. It's the best console version of Final Fantasy X. Fun fact. Nobody talks about that. Uh, Final Fantasy XV on Xbox One X is arguably the best place to play that game on console. And it's super impressive what they did on that console with that game. In fact, the Forza Horizon team, sorry, the Forza Motorsport team helped them port over Final Fantasy XV to the One X. So they did a good job with that. And like Crisis Core on Xbox runs at full 4K, 60 frames per second, absolutely flawless and i will praise that game all day <laughs> that, that is an incredible game it's arguably one of my favorite grpgs now and you know the xbox ports have actually been really good ports and that's that's one of these things that people don't talk about they'll say that xbox fans don't play grpgs we do but you have to put them on the platform and market them that's the biggest issue there's people i know that didn't know that final fantasy 15 was on xbox till like five years after it came out which is crazy because they couldn't market it. Um, but anyway, I think it's coming. I think all signs point to it. It's coming. Like, and you, you have these detractors on Twitter that like they'll take like excitement over people wanting the game on the platform, and they'll, like I, I talk about upcoming games on Xbox. I talk about upcoming games coming to Xbox on uh, Twitter as well, and like the second I mention Final Fantasy, people lose their marbles. And it's, oh, they don't like it. Yeah, they don't like <laughs> it. And it's like the Persona fans, I noticed, were actually really welcoming to Xbox fans. Uh, you know, Yakuza. By the way, I never saw... I'd say many people argue against Yakuza coming to Xbox. Like it was, they were fairly positive. You know, Final Fantasy fourteen fans, even the Japanese like gamers that are obsessed with Final Fantasy fourteen, they are hyped that it's on Xbox now. Literally hyped. And, like, there was a huge celebration that it's actually on Xbox now. So, like, there is a market for the game. You know, I think there's, like, some weird gatekeeping when it comes to Final Fantasy specifically. Like, it's strange. It's very strange. And it's a third-party game made by, made by Square Enix. Square Enix isn't owned by PlayStation. And if you remember correctly, Final Fantasy was originally a Nintendo franchise. So, like, I, I don't know... I don't know what happened there, you know. Uh, I just think it's weird that people get so in their feelings about... Gamers just wanting more games to come over. 
It's crazy. And you know, you'll have these people on Twitter, they'll port beg first party Xbox games, but the second you mention Final Fantasy 16 or 7 Remake, it's the end of the world for them. You know, it's weird, man. It's weird. But anyway, I do think the game's coming, and it will be interesting to see when that game does release. So while I do think it's going to be at the June showcase, the end of this year is going to be absolutely packed for games. So I don't know what's going to happen there. Uh, but we need more games to come over as well. So, you know, the Final Fantasy Pixel remasters. Why the hell aren't those on Xbox? And I don't need anyone to say it because they don't sell. Some of the most iconic games. Those are on the fire tablet, yeah. Jamie. It man, took the budget. <laughs> that really annoyed me, man. When they announced the platform, and it said PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Nintendo Switch, PC, Kindle tablets. Bloody Kindle tablets. Who had... Who I I would love to know if there's a, a a Final Fantasy Kindle tablet fandom on Twitter. <laughs> like, are the people that port bag games <laughs> like JRPGs on Kindle tablets on Twitter? That'd be interesting. But um, are there Kindle tablet JRPG YouTubers? I might actually do some research. But like, Kindle tablets of all all things, like why put them there? Like, I I do not know how to record video games. Right? That goes without saying. Right? I don't have a clue. I've tried. I failed. But I can't imagine porting over those games to Xbox would require any effort at all. I'm just putting it out there. But yeah, more Final Fantasy games. They're coming. It's a matter of when, not an if. Now, my God, we've still got way too much to talk about. Okay, let's get the, the hit pieces out of the way. Uh, so, Chris Dane... Oh, can I slide one thing yeah. in? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Oh, sorry. Uh, it was just... It was related to the Japanese games thing that today um, the Grandia HD collection launched. Like, today or tomorrow. And that was a classic collection I never thought would come to Xbox, and it finally has. And just, you know... Go support that one. It they're beloved classics, and they kind of scratch that you know pixel remaster itch, especially. So go support those. Yeah, I, I think that like it was good to see those games come over. And you're right, it did come out today. Um, I never thought I'd see those games on console, like you said. Um, and the thing is, those are old ports, but the fact that we're going to see more of these is great. You know. Uh, I did read not long ago that there's a, a studio specifically porting over Japanese PlayStation 1 games. So, like, if you're a fan of JRPGs, and, you know, again, we don't have PlayStation 1-style JRPGs, not really on Xbox or any console, really, uh, we are going to see more of them, which is really cool. And I think, like, you will have people on Twitter that lose their mind every time a game's not listed for Xbox when it comes from Japan. Uh, the truth is, Japanese support's never been better. There's plenty of games coming. There's games that have had successful Kickstarters in Japan that are coming to Xbox. Like, you wouldn't hit your Xbox stretch goal on Kickstarter if there was no, like, crowd for it. So, yeah. Anyway, we'll move on. So, there's a, a person in the game industry called Chris Ding. Yesterday, in an interview uh, with all the GD, GDC stuff, uh, came out and said, you know, Xbox, they're pretty much done with hardware. By the way, everything he said can be debunked, and I'll go into that. So he said they're done with hardware, there's going to be less focus on Game Pass, Every basically everything on Xbox is going to PlayStation, and, you know, Xbox is on live support. And a lot of this came from the European sales, right? You know, a quote-unquote uh, sales in Europe are flatlining. What he didn't say is that sales for Xbox in Europe have never been good. They've had the UK uh, during the 360 generation, uh, part of Germany, France, and that's it, right? Xbox has never been a big brand in Germany at all. You know, one of the reasons why Microsoft like used to take gamescom and still does to an extent takes gamescom so seriously it's because that is the game and hub of europe you know playstation they don't really show up there nintendo they really don't show up there microsoft does show up there 
to try and get things going. That's why they make partnerships and Game Pass deals for, you know, the farming sim games and all that stuff, because those games are big in Europe. The RTS games are big in Europe. Like, Stalker is a huge franchise in Europe. Absolutely massive franchise. And it was a big deal that they come in the, the new ones come into the console and also the collection. So, like, what he said made no sense because Microsoft put more effort into the Game Pass than ever before. They have more investment in first-party studios and IP than ever before. They announced multiple generations of consoles. The stuff coming this year, which we'll talk about in a bit, and the stuff coming in the future with next-gen hardware with the biggest technological leak they've ever done. Need to catch my breath than ever before. So that's debunked as well. And the fact that he said that basically everything is coming over. Now, bear in mind, hardware costs a lot of money to make. You know, R&D research and development for these consoles that we all play, you know, be it PlayStation, Nintendo, Xbox, they cost billions to make. Billions with a B, capital B. And, like, even though Microsoft does make some weird decisions in the way they talk too much and <laughs> how transparent they are and how how maybe they're too transparent, Microsoft, they have a, a, a habit of putting their foot in their mouth and talking too much. So, like, Chris Ding says that, and, you know, back in February, they said there's only four games going over to PlayStation, and, you know, in a later interview, he said, maybe more do in the future. Now, I don't think this is going to be a whole slate, everything is going over, but if you look at Hi-Fi Rush, it's a smaller game, made sense, kind of. You know, Pentiment, I've never seen a PlayStation gamer talk about this game, by the way. (laughs) Like, Logan, have you seen anyone on PlayStation talk about Pentiment? Um, besides some real, like, um, artistic, you know, people who really enjoy the unique and different or were already, you know, Obsidian fans or Josh Shire fans or were cri- critics who had tried the game on another platform. Besides them, not really, no. Yeah, so, like, I, I, I think, like, you know, save, I think Save Thieves would be massive on Switch. Well, Switch 2, you know, there's clearly a, a want for that game on PlayStation. Uh, but, like, I don't think this, like, exercise by Microsoft is going to work. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But bear in mind, all these things I'm talking about with Chris Ding, who's, by the way, has hated on Xbox for years it's not like a new thing it's not like oh xbox is going away it's like the fact that he's always hated on xbox i put it like this what's happened on playstation in the past few months that's negative you know they closed down studios the end and they basically end in uh production or at least slowing down production putting it to a halt playstation vr2 which is an expensive piece of technology an impressive piece of technology that doesn't get utilized they closed studios they closed down games cancelled games shall i say uh, the looking at putting PlayStation VR two on PC, and basically a piece, a, a, an accessory that costs more than the console itself has been abandoned. Right, people lost their marbles when the 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 Connect, shall I say, got less support, and the Connect in the UK, I think it was ninety nine pounds. I think it was ninety nine pounds. Uh, and all hell broke loose. But you have this VR headset, which again costs more than the console. Uh, there's been no negative talk about it in the media, not really. Uh, they shut down studios, which is fine. They clo- they cancelled games, which is fine. And you have this Chris Ding person, and you know all these other articles popping up talking about Xbox. Now Phil Spencer did come out today talking about how. The landscape of gaming's changed and all this stuff. And again, people overreacted, actually had to read the article. Uh, but one of the major takeaways from it is that more games are going to other platforms, which I think everyone knew that smaller games, like Microsoft, even though they have a, a ton of like AAA games in development, they also have small games in development. And people tend to forget that. And, you know, you don't invest in hardware if you aren't going to have exclusives. No matter, I don't... I know Phil Spencer likes to live in this world where everything would be on everything. I think everyone listening would lo- love to have Mario on Xbox. You know, have Super Smash Brothers on PlayStation, have Uncharted on Xbox, right? You know, 
have Gears of War on your Switch, right? We don't live in that world where that's feasible, right? I would love it if everything was on everything, but pieces of hardware and ecosystem needs exclusives. Despite what Phil Spencer says, they know this. And I think one of the big problems with the Xbox community and what Phil Spencer says and what people at Xbox say is that Phil Spencer talks way too much. No matter what happens at PlayStation, no matter all the negative articles that come out, nobody from PlayStation says anything, right? You don't have these executives at PlayStation saying much. You know, you have Jim Ryan flapping his gums saying some weird stuff. And people react to that. But outside of that, PlayStation, they're very silent. You know, Nintendo executives are very silent. But Phil Spencer says something, and it's in the news all the time. So when he talks so much, it's in the news every single month, which is creating food, which makes the community wondering what's happening with the future. IGN reported on, you know, 15 times a day. So, like, the fan base right now, I think they are, I think they are well within their rights to actually be concerned with the way the information is being presented. But I I don't think they <coughs> excuse me. I don't think Xbox is going away. I don't think they're getting rid of exclusives. They have more in development than ever before. But the fact that Phil Spencer is asked these questions daily and we hear about it daily, weekly, it's a problem. Like executives shouldn't be talking this much in public about their future plans. We shouldn't know about a handheld. We shouldn't know about hardware coming this year or the the fact that they're making a next gen console. We shouldn't know that right now. It's the fact that people react to news, so they have to tell us. And I think Microsoft, sometimes they are way too transparent for their own good to the point where everyone reacts to it. Let Logan, what was your take on that? Because today, it was kind of wild. And the stuff that Chris Sting said yesterday, I think was blown out of proportion way too much. Yeah, like, um, starting with the Phil stuff, like... I part of me wonders if they're going like overboard transparent because there was that period of time for a few months when all those rumors were going just absolutely like Arkham Asylum like psychotic and running rampant and you know it's like it goes from a whisper of some oh acclaimed game back in its day might come over to like literally gears for to you know they're they're stripping down the house to the bear they're just everything must go fire sale export of all things xbox to everywhere you know sinking ship nothing to see here the end is nigh like all that stuff was running rampant with no fact checking no public you know acknowledgement nothing part of me thinks the very open and transparent stuff now is an overcorrection for that of when they really needed to say something and they were nowhere to be seen hiding out in a bunker cave cayman islands you know retreat wherever like they were gone people needed to hear from them and they couldn't be bothered and that really royally made people mad and, ang- and, like, turn some people off from the platform, to be honest. So, part of me thinks it's, you know, going the opposite direction and being, like, almost, <laughs> almost like they're just tweeting their plans. Just, like, immediately, like, they have a thought and they just post it. And, you know, I love information. I love transparency. But... There is a time and place for sometimes just, you know, staying in your lane a little bit and just, you know, just because there's an awkward silence doesn't mean that you need to fill it with something. Sometimes there are just dead periods where nothing's happening. Having said that, I'm excited about the handheld thing. We'll dive into that in a little bit. But communication has always been xbox's biggest bugaboo they they had it forever when they had too many execs talking at the same time everybody saying something else and then you get counter messaging and like who's really accurate who's really in power whatever 
Somebody should, you know, just be told to be quiet and go away for a while and just have one person in charge of talking. They seem to have, for the most part, dealt with that. But now they're saying one thing last month about, okay, it's going to be these four, maybe some more, this or that, to, well, you guys, maybe we should have said this last month during our update, but the industry itself is entirely changing. We're having to look at this really hard. It's in a bad spot, and you're you're just going to have to roll with it because it is what it is. It just it makes people on a swivel a little too much. And yeah. then, I know this is long-winded, but it, it's a long topic. But as for the dream stuff, it... I go back to, okay, where does information come from? Who is saying it? What is track record? What is relationships with things going on? For your sources of information and where where it's being put out and how it's being phrased and put out and stuff. If there's someone who put who is a Nintendo insider and has really good information on the Nintendo front and they're posting stuff about Nintendo, you're like, okay, that this is the guy or girl. Like, okay. They know what they're talking about about this topic. I should listen to them. Nintendo stuff, I'm listening to them. But if they really don't have anything, you know, a firm, you know, place in the Xbox network or ecosystem and community fully ingrained, you know, positive force in that industry community, and then starts throwing stuff off about Xbox, no matter who it is, it just... It kind of takes you back and you're like, okay, well, why is that? And it, it just feels like all this Xbox stuff from anybody, no matter who it is, just comes out of the woodwork whenever there's a dead period and it spikes news and clicks and then everybody gets up in arms about it and it pays the rent for another month or two. It, it just feels like we're at that point. And then the fact that it starts from... A rumor of some supposed big dev who published a quote big game wonders why we're supporting this platform and whether we should bother with it or not. One, we don't know the publisher and, you know, big publisher and big game could be quite subjective to whoever it is. Like, there are some things that, you know, I would consider a massive title. Other people would be like, I've never even heard of that. Or I don't care about that at all and second you know now it's being spinned from the one publisher one game to the industry is doubting the future of this and this it's like people are taking a lot of miles off of a few inches of statements yeah, yeah. Seeing IGN and VGC post that multiple developers, uh, sorry, developers, uh, you know, uh, regret putting the game on Xbox. They were talking about one game by one developer, and I think you know, the gaming media they kind of lie a lot. They they rely on clicks, you know. Um, it, it's early on the year still, so ad revenue is at its lowest. So like every everything you see is clickbait. Like IGN have been community noted what six times this year so like people have to be careful with what they read and by the way when people think your know, xbox is going away i just did uh i just looked it up so do you know the wii u sold 13.56 million consoles right nintendo was in dire straits with that my local like supermarkets stopped stocking wii u games and consoles in 2013 right it wasn't even a year after the console came out and they stopped stocking the games. And, you know, people thought Nintendo was going to go away and Nintendo going to go third party. Bear in mind, they sold 13 million consoles. And what happened? They had a good business plan. They came out with a good device that people loved. And they turned it around to the point where Nintendo has the best-selling console this generation. <laughs> like, 
like Nintendo PlayStation is second. People act like the first, but Nintendo is way up top. They are number one. You know, like Mario Kart has sold like fifty million copies or something ridiculous, and it's because the Wii U was a failure. It had Mario Kart eight on it. Nobody bought it because nobody had the Wii U. But the second they put that on the Switch two and they made the Switch work, Nintendo. It, they, it clearly worked out for them. And I think that with Microsoft, like we've talked about this before, Microsoft's marketing of Xbox has been bad for a while. I never see adverts or trailers on TV or YouTube in the UK for Xbox. And they need to correct that. I do think, however, they're going to fix that later this year. You know, with the new hardware and Call of Duty being marketed with them. Because remember, Call of Duty hasn't been with Xbox marketing since 2014. Right, it's been a long while since Microsoft's had the Call of Duty card, so I think they're going to be going big this year. I just hope they actually market what the console can do. Like people buy their Xbox Series X and S and don't know certain games have upgrades. I've had to tell people that hey, do you know, like you can play 360 games on your new console, and they had no idea. You know, uh, th- that's that's something they co- they can actually correct and. We'll end the, the Phil Spencer bit when I say that. One of the things he said, and he was actually right, he said that Gen Z gamers aren't really buying hardware or they're not getting hardware bought for them. He is actually right about that. You know, there's this subset of Gen Z that the concept of buying a piece of hardware to buy a game is a weird concept for them because they grew up on Fortnite. You know, this free-to-play game that they probably played on their mother or father's PlayStation or Xbox or PC. And, you know, they had Fortnite readily available, a free game on a device they already had. And those gamers, they find it a weird concept to buy hardware and buy games. So now you have this generation of gamers, which are basically changing the industry for all of us, unfortunately. (laughs) You know, um, Fortnite has done so much damage to gaming. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's a good game, but it's done so much damage. Um, but like Microsoft, they were right about that. Like people, like the console gaming space has been around two hundred million consoles for the past twenty years. Why is that? It's be- it's because of that. The only people that buy consoles, uh, the people buying them for the kids now. There's people like me and Logan that have basically been console gamers their entire lives, but there aren't there's no new console gamers coming out of the woodwork you know you have people i know for this for a fact there's people that used to be big back in the call of duty back in the day but in the meantime they've had kids and now they're looking to get back into gaming again so that's why you have a lot of people jumping in call of duty for, for the first time in like 10 years and like those people are coming back but like i don't see the console space getting any bigger so where do we go from here well, there's been rumors for the past, what, two months that Microsoft may be working on a, on a handheld console. Uh, I'm, I'm mixing up names here. I was going to say Jim Corden. Um, Jez, Jez Corden from Windows Central has basically said multiple times this past month that a handheld is coming. You know, the prototype, prototype and different devices. If you had asked me five years ago that, you know, do I think Microsoft should or would make a handheld console, I would call you crazy. I'd say you're taking crazy pills. I don't think anyone outside of Nintendo can do handheld at all. But the Steam Deck clearly changed that. You know, the Steam Deck is not a cheap piece of hardware. It's something that actually costs a decent amount of money. And it showed that there's this want for handheld consoles again. You know, that aren't just Nintendo devices. Um I do think that also goes towards that on PC, if you want to play games portably, your only option was an overpriced game and laptop. But the Steam Deck, the ROG Ally, and all those other devices, they are basically an affordable option for PC gaming to be portable. Um, but now you have Microsoft looking at this opportunity to make an Xbox handheld. And it would, like, think, think about it like this Microsoft, their biggest like thing is backwards compatibility and compatibility in general with their ecosystem like you don't have to sync achievements all your saves work seamlessly you go to the store and you you get the correct game for the correct device like people will give microsoft crap but nobody has a console ecosystem like microsoft they just don't 
right? And that will never change. You know, Microsoft's had uh, this like weirdly good inter- integrated ecosystem for years. You can fire up your Xbox One or Xbox Series console and pull saves from your 360 that go back to 2005. It's crazy how that works, and it's super cool. If you could get an Xbox handheld that played these games natively, going back four generations, your Xbox, your Xbox 360, your Xbox One, and your Xbox Series games, which it looks like it's going to be a thing, I think there would be a lot of gamers that would actually jump on that chance to play these games portably. Because even me, I only play games on my couch, or in the office. I only play games in my house, sitting down. But the prospect of being able to play my games portably, I've actually came... I've actually... I like the idea of that now. I like the idea that maybe I could just sit in bed and play handheld games. I can just sit outside and play handheld games natively. Lost Odyssey, portably. You know? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting proposition because... I think going back to the 360, I think I've I've seen a lot of people say, wouldn't it be cool if there was an Xbox handheld? I don't know if you remember the meme Logan, you know, the Xbox boy, people used to call it. Um, I think it's going to happen. Yeah, I remember that in the Xbox 720, yeah. <laughs> what they thought the Xbox One was going to be. It was some abomination looking like just monstrosity of a Switch looking thing that never happened, but... Well, <laughs> we might be getting it. Yeah, and by the way, if you ever watched the the Hugh Jackman film, uh, what's it called, Real Steel, the when they're in the stadium fighting, there's actually signs on the wall in the background that say Xbox Seven Twenty. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's awesome. I miss that. <laughs> but like, uh, hey, can you imagine if they called it the Xbox Seven Twenty? <laughs> like, like, especially with the resolution gate that happened back then. Wow. Um, that oh been, man, uh, they would have been roasted yeah. so bad. Uh, but the the handheld, I do think is coming. I don't think like I, we've talked about this before. I there's this thought that next generation they're going to launch the super duper powerful console and a handheld. I'm of the belief now that the handheld comes out this year because I don't know the power draw of a next gen console. Like what they're going for next gen. Could you squeeze that into a handheld? But if you can squeeze an, a Series S into a handheld, and, you know, Phil Spencer, like, as much as he talks, he's talked about portable gaming a lot. And, like, the Steam Deck is huge. The ROG Ally. There's all these new PC portable handhelds coming out all the time, and there's so much excitement for them. But there's no way to, like, you can't natively play your Xbox games on these machines you just can't you can't have that xbox experience but if you cram an xbox series s with you know the ui your achievements your friends list your your, your store your game pass your entire library of games people have libraries of hundreds if not thousands of games if you can put that in a handheld which it looks like they will i think it's coming this year the way sarah bond kind of worded it during the the february podcast where she said we have interesting things that's going to be announced this holiday or for this holiday well they're not going to announce next gen because that's 2026 so like they have the digital series x which, which is coming out which leaked last year but when she said pieces of hardware that just got me thinking that one of them is a handheld like logan especially with you know phil spencer talking about the handheld stuff this past week and you know yesterday uh what's your take on the whole like portable console thing because it looks like it might actually be happening i'm a hundred percent all in on it like i want it to happen i i need it to happen at this point but i do think this year it will be the um the mobile console will be what is revealed later this year i i don't think they're gonna do a mid-gen refresh they i know we, we we just talked about Phil flip-flopping on some things he said, but, you know, taking him at his word at what they had said when some of those documents from the FTC trial leaked about, you know, a Series X without a disk drive or, you know, you know maybe a mid-gen refresh, something like that. To me, I just, I don't think that 
matches the energy of the room right now. And I think with him coming out and talking so much about mobile with Rog Ally, Lenovo Go, Steam Deck, all these mobile PCs just absolutely cleaning shop and wrecking the NPD boards and getting everybody's interest. They're like, why, you know, have a console if I can play my console games and my PC games all on the go? Like Jez has said, you know, quite elegantly on their show that, you know, Steam is basically has made a portable console using Xbox and PlayStation's own exclusives against them. So it would be kind of negligent at this point not to have your own. Like, go ahead and embrace those and support those, but also have your own so you can get your own piece of the action, your own, you know, have your cake and eat it too. So to me, I think it's coming this year and I think it will be native and I am all in and I can't wait for it. At the very least, they've said that this year we will be able to play games we own on the cloud at the very least. Like, not just Game Pass titles. So, at least see something related to that. But I do think native cloud con or native handheld device is coming and will be coming this year. Yes. I do think it will cost a pretty penny, though. I do not think this is going to be a cheap device by any stretch of the imagination. Yes. Yeah, so, you take it. Let's just go off Series S hardware, which is, I think, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, which is a uh, two hundred and fifty pounds, I think, in the UK. So let's let's just mess around with that price. Uh, you slap on an LCD screen at the cheapest. You've got the battery. You've got the integrated controller. Like, I think maybe they could get one out for four hundred dollars at a push. Um, but I think you know when it comes to like like nobody expected the Steam Deck to be cheap. You know, you're getting decent hardware, decent power. Um. I think that, you know, when it comes to, like, the Xbox handheld, I don't think people would be that bothered with the price that much. Like, I don't think it would be, like, $800 or something like that. I think it would be in the range of 4 to 5 Like, even if it's the same price as a Series X, but you're getting this handheld experience, I don't really think anyone would have an issue. As long as you get the value, you know, how would storage work on it? Because I don't think you'd be <laughs> sticking in one of those storage cards in the back. Um... They'd have to sort that out. Maybe there's a new storage format specifically for the portable. But, like, I, I will I will say this. It is cool to see that there's so much excitement for an Xbox handheld right now, despite all the FUD going on. Like, Xbox handheld has been trending for two days in the UK. Great news. Yeah, like, people do want that. Like, it's kind of funny because the thought of a portable Xbox makes me just think, oh, I can play 360 games. <laughs> like, I'm obsessed with that generation of games. Um, but, like, I don't know. Like, I think, like, there's a there's a huge market for portable gaming right now. And who knows? Like, Microsoft later this year, they have Call of Duty marketing. It's going to be a big deal for them. You know, Activision Blizzard titles still, like, they're still coming to Game Pass this year, which is going to be a big deal. Like, we don't actually, the gamers don't know what the effect of Call of Duty and Game Pass is going to be like. Because it could work out for them really well. It may not move the needle at all. I don't think it'll be a negative thing, but like I will put it like this. When the ABK deal was first announced and surprised everyone, I went to the supermarket that night and I bought an, uh, an Xbox uh, gift card thing. And that the person behind the, the counter literally mentioned, hey, I'm going to be able to get Call of Duty in that Game Pass service. Like someone I would consider a, a normie, you know, the majority of gamers are normies. You know, these people that just, they play the games, they don't keep up with gaming news, they buy one or two games a year. Like this person was excited about Call of Duty launching in Game Pass. And that was someone that doesn't keep up with gaming news. Like that's a powerful thing. And, you know, I think, you know, looking back at all those things that's happening this year with all the games like microsoft they have a huge first party slate coming they have avowed hellblade uh, flight sim 2024 towerborn age of mythology indiana jones there's going to be a bunch of other games announced this year like the oblivion remakes coming this year slash remaster 
uh, to bring this to this both. They have pieces of hardware coming out this year. There's a new controller coming out this year, which has haptic, uh, advanced haptic feedback. It looks like it's wearing a pair of trousers for some reason. Um, you know, there's a digital Series X. People have been wanting a digital Series X, at least what I've seen from the, the, the launch. You know, a handheld would be huge this year. Uh, so despite you have all these people online saying, oh, Xbox is done and all this stuff, like, look at where Nintendo was with the Wii U. It's going to be fine. It's just that Phil Spencer needs to not talk as much. <laughs> and the thing is, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Phil Spencer. He basically saved Xbox. If you go back 10 years ago, when Don Matrick was in charge, like, they were focused on entertainment so much where they had to completely restructure not just how Xbox One works, but, like, how the ecosystem works. They had to finally start work on backwards compatibility, which wasn't going to be a thing. But because of Phil Spencer, it was. So, like, after all of that and all the investment in the game, and I do, I, I, I have no doubt whatsoever that Xbox is going to be fine. It's just that certain things are said, it's stretched out a bit, there's overreaction. It is what it is. Like, even people at PlayStation have said that there will be games that go multi platform. And bear in mind, back in 2016, when Quantum Break was announced for PC, people lost their marbles. People said that games going to PC made it so Xbox, you don't need to buy an Xbox. That, that's been a thing people have said for years. Do you know what happened when PlayStation announced they're going to start putting games on PC? Those same people that said that for years magically stopped saying it. It's because their, their favorite platform started adopting something Microsoft did. The problem with Microsoft is, is that they are ahead of the curve, and sometimes they're too ahead of the curve. It's worked out well for them in the past with the uh, needing broadband for the original Xbox, having an integrated store on the Xbox 360 with achievements. You know, having a wireless controller was made a standard because of the 360. But what else has Microsoft worked on in that time? The, the Kinect being a smart speaker, essentially, and a smart camera. And what happened three years later? Every company on earth start putting out these smart speakers. You can still buy them today. You know, everyone has a smart speaker. It is what it is. Um, look at the, uh, what do you call it? The HoloLens. The HoloLens was super impressive technology when it was announced. But a lot of VR headsets now do that spatial tracking with AR. That Apple headset, which costs like £3,500, you know, that does the same thing. And there's more companies adopting that technology and it's more affordable than ever outside of the Apple thing. And like Microsoft, they were too early. And remember back in 2013, they were wanting to have a, a first party lineup of, uh, what do you call it, films and TV. Like they wanted to have original programming made by them based on their you know intellectual properties. People hated it. They, they literally scrapped their entire entertainment division overnight and what's popular now? Streaming apps. <laughs> like, every company has a streaming app now. And everyone's adopting TV shows from video games. And movies from video games. So it's like, Microsoft, they, they pivot in one direction. It's too soon. And maybe it's too soon in a good way or a bad way. Now, we'll see this year with Microsoft adopting the, the you know handheld console. Again, I think it's coming this year. Like, look at Game Pass. Game Pass literally changed the the industry in gaming pretty much you know people look at 70 dollar games as costing too much you have game pass which makes hundreds of millions of dollars every month and it's a proven thing that works despite the fact that you have these indie developers now and then that want some attention so they'll say that the whole thing doesn't work but look at playstation they've adopted playstation plus to be more like game pass than ever before and over time they'll start getting day one games it's just a matter of when not an if and I think as of right now, Xbox is in a great space. They have all more first-party games in development than ever before. They have hardware coming, which is going to be interesting. They have a pair. They have a controller that has a pair of trousers. Like I said, uh, I don't get that color scheme for some reason, but hey, it has gyro support, and I think a lot of people have been wanting that. Like people need to calm down. People lose it on Twitter. People have, people have been missing from Twitter for months now just because of all this information and leaks and stuff. Like people need to take a seat, take a step back. You know, sit down, it's going to be fine. It's just uh, reactionary. People like to be reactionary on Twitter. It is what it is. Uh, Logan, have you got anything else to say on the topic before we close out the show? 
Um, just on that whole, like, always being too soon thing, is like, you know, it almost makes it seem like, you know, Matrick and all these other guys, you know, they, almost like Nostradamus, but to a negative effect. Like, they, they saw the future coming, but they didn't properly adjust to it. Like, it was, like you said, too soon, or too much or too little in various areas they just had a hard time making the right thing but at least they read the room correctly just not at that moment and it just now that we've gone full circle in media and adaptations of games are becoming a thing across you know um films tv series anime whatever what what would you think if I if you if someone were to make a prediction, just throwing it out there that Microsoft's next big acquisition was not quote a gaming studio, but was a um a film studio or a film producing um like streamer or something like that as their next big acquisition. And that that would then become home to all their Xbox um, movies and anime and film publications. And basically they would have in-house studio and publishers and stuff to work on cranking out not only games, but adaptations of their own IP. To me, that company sounds like Warner Brothers. (laughs) Um. I mean that 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 that's an idea. I I I would personally wouldn't do that one because I think they have a whole lot of issues right oh, yeah. now. But just throwing it out there that I I think that would make sense to me anyway. Yeah, it could happen. You know, like <laughs> even though it is movies and games and stuff, it it is where a lot of companies are going. Like and it, like some companies now want to invest into gamers because like they've pretty much maxed out their TV and you know, movie stuff. So it, it's a weird the whole entertainment industry, you know, movies, games, television. It's all in a weird spot at the minute. You know, you have cinema dying pretty much. You have TV shows like I we've talked about this before. I think most TV shows, modern TV shows, are awful, Ab- absolutely like trash fire, awful. Thankfully, we have Shogun, which is the best thing ever made. But, um, by the way, Logan, did you start watch, watch, watching Shogun? I have not, but I want to. I think I'm going to wait till the season's done and then binge. Right. <laughs> I know this is an Xbox podcast, but I want to talk about it quickly. Uh, Shogun on Disney+. Plus. I think it's on Hulu in the US. Um, it's arguably one of the best TV shows ever made. <laughs> like, it's... Um, it's really, really good. Like it's 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 Game of Thrones season one through three good, and it's amazing to the point where look, I, I'm not gonna lie, I stayed up till four in the morning to watch it. <laughs> like I was needing to get my fix of the new episode, so I stayed up till four in the morning to watch Shogun on Disney Plus because it is just perfection. You know, we live in an industry where, you know, video games aren't changing. There's nothing original. TV shows, I think most TV shows are absolutely terrible. Like, outside of Mayans MC, Star Trek Strange New Worlds, Loki, The Night Agent, I think most modern television shows are just awful. Awful. Um, anyway, if you listen to this, uh, be it live right now or afterwards, please watch Shogun. <laughs> I'm kind of obsessed with that show at the minute. Um, absolutely amazing. But yeah, video games. This is what the podcast is about. Uh, it's going to be fine. People need to to calm down. Anyway, we'll be back at the same time next week. Everyone in chat has been amazing this week. Um, you know, we I, I like to say best chat on YouTube. There's never any like arguing. There's rarely fanboys that get angry and, you know, join in the chat. Anyway, but between now and next week, I have a a video I've been working on for a while. It's dropping uh, within the next two days. Really good. Uh, Spent a long time making it. Um, Getting back to weekly videos. Again, with my hand injury earlier in the year, it's been difficult to make content. Now it's actually healed 
almost fully, which is really good. I can make weekly content again. Anyway, so new video in the next few days between now and next week. All Things Xbox Podcast returns on Tuesdays, usual time. Uh, if you listen to this in the UK, the clocks change on Sunday. Uh, so it will go back to 11pm UK time, which is uh, even better for me. Uh, but yeah, anyway, we'll be back next week. We are out, everybody. Peace.